Yo, what's up everybody? Professor V here and this is the lecture for Abnormal Psychology Chapter 13, Abnormal Behaviors in Childhood and Adolescence. Let's go. Children and teenagers often experience psychological disorders just as adults do. Some of the disorders are found in both children and adults, such as depression and anxiety. However, there are some that are seen in children only and may develop into other psychological disorders or personality disorders in adulthood. In differentiating between normal and abnormal behavior in childhood and adolescence, we consider children's ages, genders, family, and cultural backgrounds, and developmental levels. This can be difficult as behaviors seen in children may be considered normal, while if they were seen in adults, it would be considered abnormal. For example, determining that seven-year-old Rico is hyperactive depends on the types of behaviors deemed reasonable for children of the same age and cultural background. Children are naturally very active and have an imagination that shows. Just because a child is active doesn't mean they have Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder or ADHD. Often, childhood psychological disorders are first identified when the child begins school. But why though? One of the reasons is because parents often see their children as normal and perfect children. Problems may have been brushed off as normal behaviors, tolerated, or just unnoticed. Another reason is the stress brought on by school, which then in turn contributes to the onset of psychological disorders. You also have to keep in mind what is socially acceptable at a particular age, such as intense fear of strangers. This is perfectly normal for children at certain ages. Often children are either misdiagnosed or not diagnosed altogether because a therapist fails to take into account developmental expectations. Many children are misdiagnosed with ADHD in kindergarten and treated with medication simply because they were the youngest and hence the, the least mature children in their classes. A researcher, Todd Edler, once told a reporter, if a child is behaving poorly, if he's inattentive, if he can't sit still, it may simply because he's five and the other kids are six. My parents thought I had leukemia and took me for a blood test. The doctor took some blood from my earlobe. I cooperated. I was intrigued by a multicolored cardboard wheel the doctor had given me. I also had hearing tests because although I mimicked everything, it appeared that I was deaf. My parents would stand behind me and make sudden loud noises without my so much as blinking in response. The world simply wasn't getting in. The more I became aware of the world around me, the more I became afraid. Other people were my enemies, and reaching out to me was their weapon, with only a few exceptions. My grandparents, my father, and my auntie Linda. I collected scraps of colored wool and crocheted bits and would put my fingers through the holes so that I could fall asleep securely. For me, the people I liked were things, and those things, or things like them, were my protection from the things I didn't like, other people. The habits I adopted of keeping and manipulating these symbols were my equivalent of magic spells cast against the nasties who could invade me if I lost my cherished objects or had them taken away. My strategies were not the result of insanity or hallucination, but simply harmless imagination made potent by my overwhelming fear of vulnerability. People were forever saying that I had no friends. In fact, my world was full of them. They were far more magical, reliable, predictable, and real than other children, and they came with guarantees. It was a world of my own creation where I didn't need to control myself or the objects, animals, and nature which were simply being in my presence. 
Psychological disorders of childhood and adolescence often have a special poignancy, perhaps none more than autism. These disorders affect children at ages when they have little capacity to cope. Some of these problems, such as autism and intellectual disability, formerly called mental retardation, prevent children from fulfilling their developmental potentials. Some psychological problems in children and adolescents mirror those found in adults, problems such as mood disorders and anxiety disorders. In some cases, the problems are unique to childhood, such as separation anxiety. In others, such as ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, the problem manifests itself differently in childhood than in adulthood. Approximately 4 in 10 adolescents have experienced a diagnosable mental disorder during the past year and 1 in 10 children suffer from a mental disorder severe enough to impair development. The most common diagnoses in children's age 6 to 17 are learning disorders and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Anxiety related disorders and depression are most common in adolescents. As you can see, the prevalence for childhood psychological problems is high. What is even worse is that the majority of children that do suffer from psychological disorders go untreated. Only about one third of children and adolescents who have a diagnosable mental disorder actually receive the help they need and fewer than half the more severe impairments and disturbed behavior receive help. Children with internalized problems, especially anxiety and depression, are at higher risk of going untreated than those with externalized problems or problems involving acting out or aggressive behavior that are disruptive or annoying to others. Risk factors include genetic susceptibility, environmental stressors, and family factors. As mentioned in the lecture on mood disorders, there is a genetic basis for depression. Parents can pass down the gene that predisposes their children to depression, but remember, this does not guarantee that a child will suffer from depression. Environmental factors can include having a low socioeconomic level or living in decaying neighborhoods. However, just because a child lives in a medium or high socioeconomic or in the suburbs or a wealthy neighborhood does not mean they will not suffer from a developmental disorder. It is just those that belong to low socioeconomic level are statistically more prone to developmental disorders. Other family factors can play a role in this child's susceptibility to a developmental disorder. Inconsistent or harsh discipline can cause a child to develop a psychological disorder. The inconsistencies may cause a child to become confused on what they are being punished for and lead them to incorrect behavior, especially if correct behavior is not shown and then reinforced. Remember, children are not only very active physically, but mentally as well. If punishment is given to a child at home for a bad behavior committed at the grocery store, it is quite possible that the child may not remember depending on the age and the punishment is decreasing a different behavior. This is why that when punishment is when applied, it should be done directly after the bad behavior is committed and then correct behavior should be reinforced afterwards. But that is a discussion for another class, which I hope to teach in the future. Child maltreatment, which involves neglect or physical, sexual, or emotional abuse is linked to a wide range of physical and psychological problems in childhood and follows into adulthood. Physically abused children have problems in forming healthy peer relationships and developing empathy and a sense of conscience. Children who display abnormal behavior such as torturing animals, picking fights with smaller boys, underachieves in school, and talks about committing suicide is suggestive that they may have been physically abused or neglected. Children of depressed parents are often more vulnerable to childhood mood disorders. Remember, the chapter on mood disorders in which we discuss that living with someone who is depressed can make others in the household feel stressed and then become depressed themselves. The DSM-5 identifies Autism Spectrum Disorders, ASD, on the basis of a common set of behaviors representing persistent deficits in communication and social interactions and restricted or fixated interests and repetitive behaviors. 
Autism generally becomes evident in toddlers between 18 and 30 months of age, but the average child is not diagnosed until about age six. Unfortunately, it is a lifelong severe condition. The diagnosis of Asperger's disorders is now part of the autism spectrum and is a pattern of abnormal behaviors involving social awkwardness and stereotyped or repetitive behaviors, but without the significant language or cognitive deficits associated with more severe forms of ASD. Often, it is referred to as high-functioning autism. Xavier is very affectionate. He's not afraid to. Um, he, he'll, he'll interact with other kids. I mean, but he, I'm sure he'd rather interact, you know. He, sometimes he just likes to be off by himself. He um, has... He, he does he, he does STEM now. Um, he had I, I, he has um, he, he'll take watch a video. Oh, that's the thing. He'll watch a video, a uh, DVD, the same scene over and over and over again. Wow. He'll, and now with DVDs, before it was just VCRs. Mm -hmm. Now they have DVDs, so they can zoom in. He can mm -hmm. zoom. He knows how to use the remote better than I do. He can zoom in on a certain mm -hmm. scene and. And just watch the same thing over and over again. And he perseverates. He's now talking, which was a blessing. Um, he didn't talk until I think I want to say three or four. And I, no, four, four or five. How did he um, communicate with you when he wasn't using words? Oh, uh, well, I guess we, you know, you just get used to your, knowing your child. And he was in, you know, the other people in the house, kids in the house, and my mother, and knew what he wanted. He would just go get it, or, or if he wanted to watch TV, he'd go get the video, or. Would he try to communicate with people to tell yeah. them? Oh, yes. Yeah, he would. Yeah. So he would engage in yeah, some ways. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, he would definitely engage. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so Sadie, he, what are you playing with? What, what is that? You? Xavier. What's this? Spider-Man. Spider-Man, what are you doing? Spider-Man. What's Spider-Man doing? Did you go see the movie? Hmm. Huh? Did you go see the Spider-Man movie, Xavier? Yeah. Yeah? Did uh, you like it? Yeah, I'm not going here. No. You're not going where? I'm not going. Uh, I need, I need. You need what? I <laughs> need tape. No, no, we gotta leave you the microphone on. You wanna take the microphone <laughs> yeah. off? Yeah. Yeah? You can keep it on, Xavier. No, keep it. Yes, yeah, so you can keep oh, it on. Oh. Uh, no touching. No touch it? No touch it, sit up. Sit up, Xavier. Sit up. Yes. Okay. So, did you go see the Spider-Man movie, Xavier? She's talking to you. Can you listen? Do you see the Spider-Man movie? Yeah. Do you she like is. it? Spider-Man. Yeah. Spider-Man. Have you seen it more than once? No. Did, did you see it once? No. Yeah. You did? What else did you see? Can you sit up, Xavier? Yeah. Xavier, sit up, please. Yeah. Sit up like a fifth grader, please. Then we can go. Okay. Movie. I I want I want spirit. Please. Okay, you want spirit, please. Okay, if you sit up and show good behavior. Okay. Okay. What What, what did you say you wanted, Sadie? What, what did you, you want? want? I want spirit, please. Want to watch spirit? You, you want spirit? It's a movie. Oh, you want to watch spirit? Yeah. Uh huh. And your mom said that if you do what she asked you to do, you can get to watch spirit. Yeah. We're gonna go buy it, right? All right. Okay. We're gonna get That's to buy it. That's good. Good. Can you sit up? Thank you. Good. Good job. Estimates based on 2013 statistics indicate that about 2% of children in the United States are affected by some form of autism spectrum disorder. ASD is five times more likely to occur in boys than girls. There has been a steady increase in the last 20 years. However, it may be due to the changes in the diagnostic criteria and greater awareness of the disorder. Scientists have been investigating the reasons for the increased rate of autism and some point to environmental factors, such as exposure to environmental toxins. So far, evidence suggests that some air pollutants, some metals, and several pesticides with suggestions that some volatile organic compounds, for example, methylene chloride and styrene, may be linked to autism. These associations have emerged despite difficulties of studies in this area, most notably the error in accurately measuring exposure concentrations and obtaining sufficient sample sizes. There are correlations 
with children of older fathers and ASD. This is due to the older men having a higher prevalence of random genetic mutations in their sperm cells. However, the risk remains low at 2% for fathers in their 40s or older. One of the most common misconceptions is childhood vaccinations. However, there is no scientific proof that there is a relationship between autism and the use of childhood vaccinations. Here are several features of ASD. Remember, the term spectrum. This means that those who have ASD may be on different levels of the spectrum and may not experience these features as strongly as someone else that has ASD. One of the most poignant and sad features of autism is a child's desire to be alone. They often lack social skills, language skills, and have communication problems. In some cases, the child is mute. When they can use language, it may be marked by echolalia, which is the child repeating what has been said to them, reverse pronouns in communication, and the tendency to raise the pitch of their voice at the end of a sentence as if the statement was a question? Nonverbal communication may also be impaired or absent. Autistic children often avoid eye contact and show an absence of any facial expressions. They are slow to respond to those trying to grab their attention. They may have ritualistic, repetitive, or purposeless behavior, such as flapping their arms or rocking back and forth. While they may be unresponsive to others, they do display strong emotions, especially strong negative emotions such as fear and anger. Some may self-mutilate themselves, bang their heads, slap their own faces, or bite their hands. They may also show sudden tantrums and panic. They can be very sensitive to changes in their surroundings and may throw tantrums or even cry. Despite their unusual behavior, they are often quite attractive and have an intelligent look to them. Many people believe that being autistic means you have a high IQ. However, as measured by scores on standardized tests, their intellectual development tends to lag well below the norm. Many autistic children do have normal IQs, but many show evidence of an intellectual disability. Autistic children usually have difficulty recognizing emotions, engaging in symbolic play, and solving problems conceptually. They also display difficulty in performing tasks that require interaction with other people. Original theory that autism is in response to parents who were cold and detached has been discredited. Psychologist O. Ivar, 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 I, I, don't, I don't know how to say it. We're, we're just going to go with Ivar. O. Ivar Lovas gave a cognitive learning perspective on autism. He suggested that children with autism have perceptual deficits that limit them to processing one stimulus at a time. They are slow to make associations with stimuli by means of classical conditioning. Normally, children become attached to their primary caretaker by pairing receiving food and hugs with a parent. Autistic children attend to the food or hugs, but cannot connect it to the parent. This shows the ineffectiveness of classical conditioning in children with autism. Due to a combination of genetic factors and environmental factors, the brain of an autistic child develops abnormally. When shown photos of the faces of family members, autistic individuals display a pattern of brain activation that is different from the exhibited by control suggested a different brain organization for the fundamental social skills of recognizing others. Children with autism have fewer neurons in the amygdala than non-autistic children have. They show greater activation of the amygdala when they are gazing at faces. The amygdala has been associated with fear, so this finding suggests that children with autism avoid making eye contact with people because they find it aversive. There are prenatal risks as well as maternal infections during pregnancy may increase the risk of autistic behaviors in genetically at-risk offspring. These factors may then adversely affect the developing brain in the fetus. One of the principal therapeutic tasks in working with children with autism is the establishment of interpersonal contact. Behavioral therapists use reinforcers to increase adaptive social behaviors, such as paying attention to the therapist and playing with other children. Behavioral therapists may also use mild punishments to inhibit self-mutilation. It's been shown 
that behavioral therapy has the highest rate of efficacy for treating autism. It has also been shown that the earlier the treatment is started and the more intense the treatment is, the better the results. The problem is with treatments is that intensive one-on-one -on -one treatment is very expensive and there are long waiting lists for subsidized programs. There is no drug cure or effective treatment for autism. Antipsychotic medications are the only biomedical drugs that may be used to control disruptive behaviors such as temper tantrums, aggressions, and self-injurious behavior. About 1% of children meet DSM criteria for a diagnosis of intellectual disability, also called Intellectual Developmental Disorder, or IDD. Children with IDD tend to have deficits in reasoning and problem-solving ability, abstract thinking skills, judgment, school performance, and difficulties performing common tasks required in daily life. There are several levels of IDD in which we will discuss shortly. However, children with IDD can improve on their daily functioning over time if they receive the support needed and enrich educational opportunities. Those who are raised in impoverished environments may fail to improve and even deteriorate further. To qualify for the intellectual disability diagnosis, the disability must be apparent before the age of 18. Contributing factors include biological, such as chromosomal and genetic disorders, prenatal factors, infectious diseases, and substance abuse during pregnancy, and psychosocial variables, such as exposure to impoverished home environments. Down syndrome, Klinefelter syndrome, and Turner syndrome are all due to chromosomal abnormalities. Fragile X syndrome and PKU are caused by genetic abnormalities. Down syndrome is a condition caused by the presence of an extra chromosome on the 21st pair of chromosomes and characterized by intellectual disability. It is the most frequently identified cause of ID. It occurs in about 1 in 800 births, is more likely as parents age and have children, and has distinctive physical features. Klinefelter syndrome only appears in males where there is a presence of an extra X chromosome. This means the genetic coding for the child would be XXY. It is less common than Down syndrome, but still can result in some intellectual disabilities. It occurs in one to two cases per 1,000 births. Men also fail to develop appropriate secondary characteristics that result in underdeveloped testes, low sperm production, poor muscular development, and infertility. Men with Klinefelter syndrome don't often discover they have the condition until they undergo tests for infertility. Turner syndrome occurs only in females and is characterized by a presence of a single X or partial second X chromosome. It is marked by low intelligence, especially in skills relating to math and science. Physically, they develop normal external genitals, but their ovaries remain poorly developed, reduced production of estrogens, short stature, and infertility. They also have endocrine and cardiovascular problems. Fragile X syndrome as an inherited form of intellectual disability caused by a mutated gene on the X chromosome. It is the second most common form of intellectual disability overall after Down syndrome. PKU is a genetic disorder caused by a recessive gene that prevents child from metabolizing the amino acid phenylalanine. It results in damage to nervous system, which in turn causes intellectual disabilities. I don't even know if I said the name for that amino acid right. Some cases of intellectual disability may be due to maternal infectious or substance abuse during the pregnancy. For instance, if a mother comes down with rubella, it may be passed down to the still developing child and cause brain damage that results in intellectual disability. Drugs and alcohol that the mother ingests during pregnancy may pass through the placenta to the child, thus causing birth defects and ID. Children whose mothers take alcohol during pregnancy are often born with fetal alcohol syndrome, one of the most prominent causes of intellectual disabilities. You can see here the brain abnormalities in a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. It's pretty scary, huh? Most cases fall in the mild range of severity and have no biological cause or distinguishing physical features. These cases typically have cultural familial roots, such as being raised in an impoverished home or social or cultural environment, lacking in intellectually stimulating activities, or racked by neglect or abuse. 
Children in these types of homes may not have access to toys or books or opportunities to interact with adults in stimulating ways. Because of economic problems, pe parents may have to hold multiple jobs and or work long hours, preventing them from reading and engaging with their children. Parents who were raised in impoverished homes themselves may lack the the communication skills required to help their children develop their intelligence, and thus it is a vicious cycle. Depending on the severity of the intellectual disability, a child may be treated for ID in different ways. Some children may require institutional care, around-the-clock care, or placement in residential facilities. Children with severe or profound ID are those that may need this type of treatment. An example of a child who has profound ID could be showing basic emotional responses and response to skills training in their use of their legs, hands, and jaw. They walk and have primitive speech capabilities, is incapable of self-maintenance, and has an IQ of, say, 14. Placement in an institution is based on the need to control destructive or aggressive behaviors, not the child's intellectual impairments. Children with less severe ID may be mainstreamed. However, there is debate among experts on mainstreaming versus special education classes. While some children with mild intellectual developmental disorders achieve better when mainstreamed, others may be overwhelmed and withdraw from their schoolmates. Children with ID, when grown, will need to be able to function in the world, and to help with this, appropriate training can be provided throughout their time in school and acquire basic life skills, and even vocational skills. People with ID are often at a higher risk of developing other psychiatric disorders, especially depression, anxiety, and behavioral problems. They have a difficult time to adjusting to life in their communities, making friends, and often become socially isolated. They often have low self-esteem because of child and even adult bullying, where they are demeaned and ridiculed. Many need psychological help with adjusting to life in the community. Psychological counseling has been shown to help with these issues. Learning disorders are specific deficits in the development of arithmetic, writing, or reading skills that persist into adulthood. The DSM-5 applies a single diagnosis of learning disorder to encompass various types of learning disorders or disabilities involving significant deficits and in skills involved in reading, writing, and arithmetic um, and executive functions. Did I just say um? Learning disorders significantly impact academic performance in various areas. They typically emerge during the grade school years, but may not be recognized until academic demands exceed the individual's abilities. Children with specific learning disorders involving reading difficulties have persistent problems with basic reading skills. The term dyslexia is not used in the DSM-5, but is commonly used among teachers, clinicians, and researchers to describe difficulties with reading. It is estimated to affect about 4% of school-aged children, and is much more common in boys than it is girls. Those who are dyslexic have difficulty decoding letters and letter combinations and translating into appropriate sounds. Problems with writing refers to children with grossly deficit writing skills. Deficiency may be characterized by errors in spelling, grammar, or punctuation, or by difficulty in composing sentences and paragraphs. Problems with arithmetic and mathematic reasoning skills refers to problems understanding basic mathematical operations, decoding mathematical symbols, or learning multiplication tables. Problems with executive functions are seen as struggles with higher mental abilities involved in organizing, planning, and coordinating tasks. To be diagnosed, an examiner needs to specify the particular learning deficit that interferes with academic, social, or occupational functioning, or as commonly is the case, a combination of sp specific deficits. For learning disorders, much of the research on learning disorders focuses on dyslexia, especially the underlying abnormalities in the way the brain of a dyslexic child processes visual and auditory information. It's been shown in this research that people with dyslexia have difficulty processing the sounds corresponding to particular letters and difficulty distinguishing speech sounds. Dyslexia may take two general forms, 
one more genetically influenced and the other more environmentally influenced. Therapy for all the learning disorders should include strategies tailored to each child's particular type of disability and educational needs. Another type of childhood disorders the book mentions are communication disorders. There is no dedicated slide for these, but I will go over them briefly. Communication disorders involve impaired understanding or use of language. Language disorder involves impairments in the ability to produce or understand spoken language. Specific impairments include slow vocabulary development, errors in tenses, difficulty recalling words, and problems producing sentences of appropriate length and complexity for the individual's age. In speech sound disorder, there is a persistent difficulty articulating the sounds of speech. Persistent stuttering has been classified in DSM-5 as a type of communication disorder called childhood onset fluency disorder. Social or pragmatic communication disorder is a newly recognized disorder in the DSM-5. The diagnosis applies to children with difficulties communicating verbally and non-verbally with other people. Many parents believe that their children are not attentive toward them, that they run around on a whim and do things their own way. Some inattention, especially in early childhood, is normal enough. In Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, however, children display impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity that are inappropriate to their developmental levels. ADHD is characterized by impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity and is more common in boys than girls. Other characteristics are characterized by restlessness, excessive motor behavior, continuous running around or climbing, and temper tantrums. ADHD is sometimes referred to ADD. However, the DSM does not have a separate diagnosis for ADD. There are three types of ADHD, predominantly hyperactive, impulsive presentation type, predominantly inattentive presentation type, and combined presentation type. When someone says ADD, they are referring to the predominantly inattentive presentation type. However, many still use ADD and ADHD interchangeably. ADHD affects about 10% of school-aged children, more often boys, as stated earlier. It frequently occurs with other disorders such as depression, anxiety, learning disorders, and learning disabilities. Typical onset is age 7, a time in which problems with attention or hyperactivity, impulsivity, make it difficult for a child to adjust to school. However, the features may appear any time before the age of 12. In predominantly inattentive presentation type, the problem is limited basically to attentional problems. Predominantly hyperactive impulsive presentation type refers to only the hyperactive and, and impulsive behaviors. Combined presentation type is where a child suffers from both the inattentive and hyperactive behaviors. The key features for the inattentive type are often fails to give close attention to details or makes careless mistakes in schoolwork, at work, or during other activities. For example, overlooks or misses details. Work is inaccurate. Often has difficulty sustaining attention in tasks or play activities, such as having difficulty remaining focused during lectures, conversations, or lengthy reading. Often does not seem to listen when spoken to, such as mind seems elsewhere, even in the absence of any obvious distractions. Often does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties in the workplace, such as starts tasks, but quickly loses focus and is easily sidetracked. Oh, my bad. Often has difficulty organizing tasks and activities. For example, difficulty managing sequential tasks difficulty keeping materials and belongings in order, messy, disorganized work, has poor time management, fails to meet deadlines, often avoids dislikes or is reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort, for example, schoolwork or homework for older adolescents and adults, preparing reports, completing forms, reviewing lengthy papers, often loses things necessary for tasks or activities, such as school materials, pencils, books, toys, wallets, keys, paperwork, eyeglasses, and cell phones. 
is often easily distracted by extraneous stimuli for older adolescents and adults may include unrelated thoughts and is often forgetful in daily activities such as doing chores, running errands for older adolescents and adults, returning calls, paying bills, keeping appointments. Remember, there is a diagnostic criteria for every psychological disorder. Just because you may experience one or two things on that list that I just read does not mean you have ADHD. Just keep that in mind, okay? Don't get worried. There's nothing to worry about for the most part. The key features for hyperactive impulsivity type are often fidgets with or taps hands or feet or squirms in the seat, often leaves seat in situations when remaining seated is expected. Sorry. For example, leaves his or her place in the classroom, in the office, or the workplace, or in other situations that require remaining in place often runs about or climbs in situations where it's inappropriate. Note, in adolescents or adults may be limited to feeling restless, often unable to play or engage in leisure activities quietly, is often on the go, acting as if it's driven by a motor. For example, being unable or uncomfortable being still for an extended amount of time, as in restaurants, meetings, may be experienced by others as being restless or difficult to keep up with. Often talks excessively. Often blurts out an answer before a question has been completed. For example, completes people's sentences. Cannot wait for their turn in a conversation. Often has difficulty waiting his or her turn. For example, while waiting in line and often interrupts or intrudes on others. For example, butts into conversations, games, or activities. May start using other people's things without asking or receiving permission. For adolescents and adults, may intrude into or take over what others are doing. Once again, keep in mind, that list that I just stated is a list of symptoms. And there is a criteria defined in the DSM and some of those things that I just stated, you may think that you experience some of these things. Even myself, when I say these things, I'm thinking, oh my God, that's my behavior. But if it doesn't, if those behaviors in which you do, do not happen every day or daily or consistently, then you don't have ADHD. Okay? If it doesn't interfere with your daily functioning, you do not have ADHD. The problem in defining ADHD is where does normal age appropriate overactivity end and hyperactivity begin? Assessment of the degree of hyperactivity behavior is crucial because many normal children are called hyper from time to time. Some critics of the ADHD diagnosis argue that it merely labels children who are difficult to control as mentally disordered or sick. Normally overactive children are usually goal directed and can exert voluntary control over their behavior. But children with ADHD appear hyperactive without reason and seem unable to conform their behavior to the demands of teachers and parents. Put another way, most children can sit still and concentrate for a while when they want to. Children who are hyperactive seemingly cannot. Jim, how old are you? 11. You're 11. And, um, you know, what are you here to talk about today? What's the name of... Wasn't it? Uh, so yeah. Do you know what Attention it is? Attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Okay. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And, um, Jim, tell me about what that means. What is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? It means uh, I'll come into conversations with well, I don't know thing. What was that? Yes, I mean... They'll be telling me something that I don't know a clue, and then also they just come in out of nowhere. Okay, so sometimes you and some, jump in, and sometimes I just drift off. What do you mean by that, drift off? Like I just don't, I don't, I'm not in reality. In other words, I'm only connected to my mind. Like I'm only in my mind right now, and everything else is tuned out. When does that happen for you? It just happens sometimes. Like usually in school, sometimes it happens in school. In school. So when you're in school. The teacher will be teaching, and most of the kids are kind of no, listening. Like, and what's happening no. for you? I am well, I'm hearing them, but I'm just not really paying attention. Okay. What are you paying attention to? My head. What might go on in your head? 
I know, I just think about Yeah, thinking about something different. So then so then the teacher calls on you and says, Jim, are you listening? Are you with us? No, I just call them like, okay, well, oh, what 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 uh what happened? And do you take it every day? I take it only on the weekdays. On the weekdays for school. Does it help you? Yes, I think it does help me. What does it do when you take the medicine? It's, the, it's, the medicine is supposed to make me pay, pay more attention. It help, do, you, do you think it does help you pay yeah, more I think attention? It, I think it does. I think without it, I'd probably be doing the whole entire day. Say that one more time a little slower. I think without it, I'd be doing the whole entire day. You would be. Does that happen to you on the weekends when you don't take it? No. Okay, so it's in school or it's really hard for you. Mm -hmm. It's really hard in school. How do you feel about taking the medicine? I, th I think I'm going to uh, take it on the weekdays. You, I know you, that's when you take it, but do you, do you mind taking it? No, not really. Do your friends know? Yeah. They know that you have ADHD? I think so. Have you ever talked to them about it? No, not really. Okay, but so how do you think they know? I know they know. Okay, but you're not <laughs> real sure. Oh, we came on soon, you did you? Yeah. Your close friends know. Yeah. But maybe not all the kids in class know. Is okay. that what you mean? Yeah, Anthony knows, Carrie knows. Zach knows. Zach knows. Yeah. And, and, you know, how do they know? Because I know? told them. You've told them. You said, oh, I have this ADD thing? Yeah, I told them. I told them. Okay. Is it hard for you to have friends because of no. the ADHD? No. Do you think it bothers people that no. you daydream or drift away or no, something? No, usually I don't, I don't do it with my friends. Okay. So, so that's interesting. When you're with your friends, it's easier to pay attention to them yeah. and... Yeah, because I think it's because we're using our imaginations. Okay. So you like to do a lot of imagination. Yeah, you know, if I'm playing with my friends, I'm using my imagination, then I probably won't drift off. One of the things that happens for some people with ADHD is they are, um, they move their bodies around a lot. I don't do that. You don't do that? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is it hard for you to sit still in class? Do you, is it no, hard for you to sit so. in your chair? Your mom's kind of laughing. Do you, do you disagree? Jim's never been the kind to be wandering around the classroom and getting up. His hyperactivity is more, um, small. There are genetic factors when it comes to ADHD. It tends to run in families. Having a parent who suffered from or still suffers from ADHD, their offspring has a higher chance in developing ADHD. A high concordance rate has been found in twin studies. Environmental factors can include maternal smoking while pregnant with the child or emotional stress experienced while pregnant, high levels of family conflict and poor parenting skills and handling children's misbehavior contributes to the development of ADHD. In the brain, there are differences in those that suffer from ADHD from those that do not. Affected children tend to have slightly reduced overall brain volume, about 3-4% to 4 smaller, with reductions most evident in the cerebellum and in the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe function is important for myriad complex cognitive processes, including the inhibition of impulsive behavior. In addition to structural changes, children with ADHD may have abnormal activity levels in some brain locations such as the system that signals the rewarding aspects of activities. This may account for ADHD becoming easily bored with routine activities and in need of higher levels of stimulation than their peers. For this reason, some researchers advocate treating children with ADHD with stimulant drugs like Ritalin. Stimulant medication is generally effective in reducing hyperactivity, but it has not led to general academic gains. Stimulant treatment often improves the focus and performance of children with ADHD in traditional school settings, but this treatment remains controversial because of significant risk of side effects and because some researchers review ADHD as being simply one extreme on a continuum of normal behavior. It may seem counterintuitive to prescribe a stimulant to someone 
who may suffer from hyperactivity. However, as explained in the last slide, there may be less neuronal activity in the frontal lobe, more specifically the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is responsible for inhibition of hyperactive behaviors. By stimulating the prefrontal cortex, it activates the hyperactive inhibiting properties of the frontal lobe. With less hyperactivity, a child can concentrate more easily. When it comes to stimulant drugs comes controversy. While the drugs can help a child calm down and concentrate in school and home, it does not teach them the behavioral skills they need to succeed in school, such as organizational and study skills. There is also a high relapse rate with stimulant drug treatments. Experts recognize the value of supplementing ADHD medication with cognitive behavioral therapies that emphasize skills training. There is also a non-stimulant drug, Stratera, that is used for the treatment of ADHD and increases the amount of the neurotransmitter norepinephrine available in the brain by inhibiting it from going into the neuron for recycling. It is not completely understood at the moment as to exactly why it helps, but it has been shown in studies to be more effective than placebos, but not as effective as Ritalin. Children with conduct disorder intentionally engage in antisocial behavior and violate social norms and rights of others. The disturbance in behavior causes clinically significant impairments in social, academic, or occupational functioning. It is marked by aggression to people and animals in which a child often bullies, threatens, or intimidates others, often initiates physical fights, has used a weapon that can cause serious physical harm to others, for example, a bat, brick, broken bottle, knife, gun, has been physically cruel to people, has been physically cruel to animals, has stolen while confronting a victim, such as mugging, uh, purse snatching, extortion, armed robbery, has forced someone into sexual activity. It also may include destruction of property, which is shown by deliberately engaged in fire setting with the intention of causing serious damage, or has deliberately destroyed others' property, other than by fire setting. Another symptom of cognitive disorder is deceitfulness or theft, which can include broke, breaking into someone else's house, building, or car, often lying to obtain goods or favors to avoid obligations and or has stolen items of non-trivial value without confronting a victim, such as shoplifting, but without breaking and entering, or maybe even forgery. Lastly, it can include serious violations of rules, which are shown by often staying out at night despite parental prohibitions before the age of 13, has run away from home overnight at least twice while living in the parental or parental surrogate home, or once without returning for a lengthy period and often truant from school beginning before the age of 13 years. So for example, if when Rico was nine years old, he cheats in school, steals from his neighbors and classmates and destroys his classmates' prized possessions when he cannot steal them, he is already using drugs and lies about his drug use and other antisocial activities. He has run away from home twice and he tried to burn down his family's house the first time he was returned home after running away. He has even been caught trying to mutilate the family cat. He appears to feel no guilt or remorse over his behavior. He is suffering from conduct disorder. As you can see above, it is seen more in males and females and the average age of onset is 11.6 years of age. It is often linked to the future use of drugs and alcohol and early sexual activity. It has also been linked to develop into antisocial behaviors when the child reaches adulthood. Oppositional defiant disorder is a psychological disorder in childhood and adolescence involving non-delinquent forms of conduct disturbance. Children with ODD are overly negativistic or oppositional and defy authority by arguing with parents and teachers. They are often angry, quickly lose their temper, deliberately annoy others, blame others for their mistakes, argumentative and vindictive. They may act spitefully or vindictively towards others, but do not typically show the cruelty, aggressivity, and delinquent behaviors associated with conduct disorder. For example, if Shelly is nine years old, she has a poor self-image and is often involved in disruptive behavior at home or in school. Typically, her behavior involves not following rules or doing what she is told. Interestingly, 
She almost never engages in behavior that hurts others or violates their rights. She just seems to have a difficult time accepting authority and developing positive relationships with those around them. She is suffering from oppositional defiant disorder. A number of neurobiological markers, for example, lower heart rate and skin conductance reactivity and abnormalities in the prefrontal cortex and amygdala have been associated with oppositional defiant disorder. Harsh, inconsistent, or neglectful child rearing practices are common in families of children and adolescents with oppositional defiant disorder, and these parenting practices play an important role in many casual theories of the disorder. Many believe that ODD is an expression of their temperament as the difficult child type. For conduct disorder, family level risk factors include parental rejection and neglect, inconsistent child rearing practices, harsh discipline, physical or sexual abuse, lack of su supervision, early institutional living, frequent changes in caregivers, large family size, parental criminality, and certain kinds of family or familial psychopathology, for example, substance-related disorders. Community-level risk factors include peer rejection, association with a delinquent peer group, and neighborhood exposure to violence. One of the treatment approaches is to teach parents how to change their child's aggressive and oppositional behavior and increase their child's adaptive behavior. This helps them with coming up with clearer rules and boundaries, use more consistent and effective discipline strategies, and use operant conditioning more effectively, especially positive reinforcements. In some cases of severe conduct disorders, children are placed in residential treatment programs that establish explicit rules with clear rewards and mild punishments, such as the withdrawal of privileges. CBT is used to teach aggressive children to reconceptualize social provocations as problems to be solved rather than as challenges to answer with violence. They may learn how to use self-talk techniques to inhibit impulsive behavior. Anxiety disorders are the most common psychological disorder among adolescents. Children also experiencing anxiety disorders, but they may go unrecognized. Children who experience separation anxiety disorder show excessive anxiety when separated from their parents. The features of separation anxiety disorder are recurrent excessive distress when anticipating or experiencing separation from home or from major attachment figures, persistent and excessive worrying about losing major attachment figures or about possible harm to them, such as illness, injury, disasters, or even death persistent and excessive worry about experiencing an untoward event, such as getting lost, being kidnapped, or having an accident, becoming ill, that causes separation from a major attachment figure. Persistent reluctance or refusal to go out, away from homes, to school, or elsewhere because of fear of separation. Persistent and excessive fear of reluctance about being alone or without major attachment figures at home or in other settings. Persistent reluctance or refusal to sleep away from home or to go to sleep without being near a major attachment figure. Repeated nightmares involving the theme of separation and repeated complaints of physical symptoms such as headaches, stomach aches, nausea, vomiting when separation from major attachment figures occurs or is anticipated. In children, it is diagnosed when the level of fear or anxiety associated with separation from a caregiver or attachment figure is persistent and excessive or inappropriate for the child's developmental level. That is, three-year-olds ought to be able to attend preschool without nausea and vomiting brought on by anxiety. Similarly, six-year-olds ought to be able to attend first grade without persistent dread that something awful will happen to them or their parents. So if Shelly is six years old, she dreads going to first grade because she worries all day that her parents are going to die while she's at school. She often worries so much that she develops nausea. At home, she clings to her parents, following them everywhere. She is deeply concerned about death and dying and wants her mommy to stay with her when she goes to sleep. She is suffering from separation anxiety disorder. Psychoanalytic theorists state childhood anxieties and fears symbolize unconscious conflicts, 
Cognitive theorists focus on the role of cognitive biases. Learning theorists state generalized anxiety is from fears or rejection of failure or failure. There may also be genetic factors that contribute. Treatments include cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and drug therapy. Depressed children, especially younger children, may not report or be aware of being depressed. Depression may also be masked by seemingly unrelated behaviors such as conduct disorders. Although rare, suicide in children does occur and threats should be taken seriously. Risk factors for adolescent suicide include gender, age, geography, race, depression, past suicidal behavior, strained family relationships, stress, substance abuse, and social contagion. Distorted cognitions of depressed children include the following patterns of thinking. Expecting the worst, pessimism, catastrophizing the consequences of negative events, blaming themselves for disappointments and negative outcomes when, even when un unwarranted, minimizing accomplishments and focusing only on negative aspects of behavior and may be reciprocal relationship between depression and distorted. Negative thoughts. Although we tend to think of childhood as the happiest and most carefree time of life, depression is actually quite common among older children and adolescents. Depressed children may report feelings of sadness and lack of interest in previously enjoyable activities. Many, however, do not report or are not aware of the feelings of depression, even though they may look depressed to observers. Depression may also be marked by other problems, such as conduct or school-related problems, physical complaints, and overactivity. Some may experience suicidal thoughts and may even attempt suicide, often suicide in children and adolescents if they experience prior sexual abuse. Suicide due to bullying also seems to be on the rise. Treatment for anxiety and depression may include drug therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, or a combination of the two. And this wraps up the lecture for Abnormal Psychology Chapter 13. Hope you enjoyed it, learned something you didn't know, and I will see you in the next lecture. Ciao. Child maltreatment, which involves neglect, physical, what? Or physical, sexual, or emo, <sniffs> emo, what? what are behaviors presenting, representing, persistent, difficult, they often allow, they often and so, what? No. Bald spots. Bald spots. High levels of family conflict and poor parenting skills.